This is actually one of uh, the most popular topics that come up and um, requested by military spouses out there, which is marriage in the military. Um, mm -hmm. But to kick things off, I want to let everybody know this is um, a Coffee Connection Live. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have been doing these since the beginning of the year and um, have had some fabulous speakers. And uh, it's just a simple way for other spouses around the world to connect with each other, to learn more about um, marriage in the military and other types of topics out there for military spouses and military families. And uh, I'm an Air Force spouse. I've been a spouse for about 10 years. I'm in the Virginia area. I've been with the USO for about 10 years and, and am the Senior Program Manager for Military Spouse Programs. So thrilled again to be here today with Corey. And Corey, I'm gonna actually hand it over to you and let you introduce yourself to the group as well. Yeah, so first of all, thank you guys so much for having me. One of my favorite things to do is to have coffee with people. And if anybody has ever attended an event or had a counseling session with me, I always have a cup of coffee. So I would first of all like to say these, these mugs are awesome. Um, so I am definitely having coffee. So let me just say that. Um, but my name is Corey. I am also, I'm a military spouse. Uh, my husband is an active duty army chaplain. Um, I am also a counselor by trade. So I'm a licensed professional counselor and have spent most of my career working with military families, now including first responder families as well. We've been married like 20 years, um, not like 20 years, actually 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, we love it. It's active duty. We're out in Kansas right now, which I came here kicking and screaming. So I'm sure there's some spouses that can relate to that one PCS location that you're like, of all places, not there. Yeah. And Kansas was it for me for some reason, but I actually love it. I actually love it. So that's where we are here. So I am thrilled to spend some time with you guys today. Uh, marriage is the niche. It is everything that I've just kind of carved my career around because I'm so passionate about it. So I'm excited to talk about that topic today and maybe encourage some of the spouses that are either listening in or might listen later on how you guys can work on your marriage because this lifestyle is pretty crazy. Yes, agreed. <laughs> and for the spouses that are joining in, if you could actually type in where you're located as well. And something fun that we could also do is if you could type in what you love about where you live right now, um, mm -hmm. because we love to, um, you know, it, sometimes it can be a challenge, like in Kansas, it could be a challenge living there, but um, there's always, we can always find the good in something too. So mm -hmm. um, let's, let's get that conversation going on the side. Um, and before we get into marriage in the military, Corey, how did you meet your husband? And was he already in the military when you guys met? And uh, yeah. tell us a little bit more about that. No, actually he wasn't. We actually met in undergrad. So in college, we met each other. We actually grew up like only a hundred miles from each other. We just, it was crazy how we just had, you know, you, it's amazing how you meet somebody later in life and you realize they were not that far from you the entire time you grew up. So, um, but we met in college and no, he was not in the military at the time we had, I always knew that I wanted to be a counselor. So I was well on my track to do that. Um, and then one day while we were in actually our graduate degree programs, um, he came home from the gym one day and said he met a Green Beret in the gym at the graduate school and came home and said, I want to be a chaplain. And I said, no, I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was not the supportive spouse because I knew, I mean, I did grow up. My dad was an Air Force pilot, okay. but he was reserved. So we didn't travel all over the place. I just knew my dad would go away one weekend a month. So I really didn't know a whole lot about the military lifestyle other than the fact that it was going to completely interrupt my plans to become a counselor. And so it actually took me about a year and a half to soften my heart. Yes. Um, but I'll tell you what, once we dove in, we dove in to the deep end and we have never looked back. It's the best decision he ever made that I ever yeah. followed his lead on. So that's for sure. And when you, when he brought that up, did you, so you, your dad was in the military. I was going to ask you, so did you, how much did you know about military, military life um, before you met or after you yeah. met him? I guess? Yeah, not a whole lot. I mean, honestly, when you, I think I'll speak for myself as a military brat and I wouldn't even call myself that because we didn't relocate a lot. Um, my dad did not, at least if he went on deployments, I didn't really, I really wasn't um, affected by it so much. I know he would go on the weekends and go and fly and do his practice landings and takeoffs. And there was times that my brother and I would go and sit this is back then 
when supervision was not that big of an issue, yeah. <laughs> but we would literally sit and watch my dad take the planes, you know, that he would take them off, take off and then circle around and land again. And so we were exposed to the aircraft that he was flying in. I remember the smell of his uniform and I could smell the diesel fuel and all of his like flight books and, and his bag and everything. So I grew up with some of that nostalgia. Right. Um, and I remember in high school just being really proud of the fact that he had done that. But other than that, um, when my husband came home and said, let's be in the army and him as a chaplain and face relocations and deployments and all of that, I'll be honest with you. And I, I get this question a lot from spouses, especially as there are new spouses coming in. There was a fear that came over me when it came to our marriage, because how can a marriage actually survive so many separations and deployments? And, and was that really good for a marriage? I think that was my biggest fear was, right. is that really good for our family? And so I really had to face that fear early on and tackle that in our marriage. So it's a good topic today. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, in, in, in your own marriage, um, well, you actually a couple years ago wrote a book called, and I have it here, Sacred Spaces. There I am. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit more about this book and how, um, how it came about? Yeah, so real quick, um, I was I got the overall award for the 2015 Military Spouse of the Year, Armed Forces Insurance Military Spouse of the Year. And honestly, this at during that year, as it got closer to Christmas, the Secretary of Defense at the time, who was Ashton Carter, okay. was gonna do his holiday tour to visit troops. And they realized they'd never taken a military spouse overseas to see deployment conditions unless they had kind of worked on the staff with a SEPDEF or in the Pentagon, um, but that was more so their job. So taking a military spouse, just kind of your average military spouse overseas that they had never done that before. Yeah. And I think that they thought that this, and I, this is how it, I think it actually turned out, but I think he, they felt that it would be good morale for families to be able to understand a little bit better what it's like overseas. So the opportunity to travel with him was an opportunity to see all, not just army deployment conditions, but I got to see every branch on deployment, which was an amazing roller coaster ride over the course of about seven days wow. of seeing everything. So I got to visit um, Turkey, which you're seeing in the news right now. Yeah. Um, I got to see two places in Iraq. Um, I got to go to Afghanistan and then I got to see two aircraft carriers in the Persian Gulf. So in the ocean. Wow. So I really got to see um, all branches deployed. And my task was really to talk with the troops and really try to figure out what is it that we as families and spouses, what is it that we don't understand and how do I write about that? So during the trip, I was not planning to write a book, but there was so much that I was learning on a, like a second to second basis. Once I got back and started to really write it out, I realized not only did this need to become a book, but I was so changed and impacted by that trip. And my marriage was so changed and impacted by that trip. I knew I had to write a book about it. And so the book is actually takes you on my journey um, of really examining my own marriage okay. and, and also taking into account what I was hearing from a lot of other military spouses and their marriage too. And um, really challenging all of us to really um, think about how this lifestyle affects us and affects our marriage and maybe some ways that we can actually move closer together in our marriage, even though the military pulls us apart. So it was a fantastic opportunity that I'm still learning from. And I actually just read the book again. I know yeah. I wrote it, but <laughs> I read it again this summer because I realized there were some things in my life that I needed to take a look at again right. and some of my attitudes. And so it really um, kind of brought me back to changing my perspective to a much more positive place. And you named it Sacred Space. Can you tell us more about why you named it that? Yeah. So what is Sacred after Space? the, yeah. Yeah. So after my, for, after our first deployment, and I think there's so many people that would relate to this, my husband came home different. Um, there was things that he experienced that I could never understood, no matter how much I tried. And there was also some things that I went through that I had changed in the year that he was gone. I was a stronger woman. I had more independence. I kind of had wrestled life into submission and he came home and was like, I have an entirely different wife than the person that I left. And so we really struggled like a lot of other couples on, we found ourselves competing for whose 
situation or whose experiences were worse. I'm yeah. sure you guys have been through that. Like, no, it was rough for me. No, it was rough for me. And so what we just decided was we needed to find a way to communicate in a way that brought us back together. So we started using the phrase sacred spaces as a way to go what you went through in that moment changed the trajectory of your life. So it's these these big major multi-sensory moments that could be either positive or negative. So they could be a traumatic experience that your service member experienced in combat. Right. It could be a joy filled moment of you having a child and all the joy that that brought and the community of friends that were there to serve you. These big, big multi-sensory moments um, that change the trajectory of your life, but they're sacred in the fact that not necessarily that they're spiritual, although they can be, it's more meaning sacred, meaning set apart, like different from your everyday moments. Yeah. It's so different that it's hard for you to explain it to somebody else in a way that they're going to fully get. So sacred spaces became a phrase that my husband and I started to use with each other to cue each other to say, Hey, this, this thing that I'm talking about, the story that I'm sharing with you, this was a sacred space in my life and you may not fully understand it, but I need you to respect it. Like I need you to tread lightly on the story. Right. And sometimes that cued each other to slow down, maybe stop what we are doing and actually pay attention to what the other person was saying, because it was something that we were calling attention to respect this fact that this thing in my life changed who I am. And we got to get to know those spaces, but we need to leave room for them in our lives. Otherwise, we're just going to trample all over each other and disrespect a lot of big, important moments in our life that we experience separately. Amazing. Well, and I think that's just so important because we're always go, go, go. And what's next and what's the next big thing? So to take time to realize what those sacred spaces are, like you said, is, is so important, especially in military marriages. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, so also in the book, you mentioned how it's important for couples to provide more detail when communicating with each other, um, especially during a deployment or when they're separated from their families from for even a TDY for a couple of days. So can you explain why it's so important to just even when talking to each other to talk about the smallest details when communicating uh, in the marriage? Yeah, so this might sound like a contradiction because, well, maybe it did to me, honestly, because I think I had gotten to a place in my marriage when we were apart that I was like, you know what, either I don't have time to write these long emails or texts on, you know, what the kids were going through and what I was going through. And maybe he doesn't have time for that. And maybe I think I also felt like if I detailed out what he was missing, I was afraid it was going to make him feel worse about being gone, right? right? Like it was just going to be a reminder that look at all these things that you're missing. And yeah. so I found myself over time giving him less and less information as a way to cushion his feelings. And because I think I busied myself so much, which is a big problem we have as spouses yes. um, when we're separated, that I just wasn't giving those details. And so this changed for me when I went overseas during this trip because it was a true role reversal moment that my husband and I went through, which by the way, while I went overseas this time to visit all of these deployment conditions, my husband was back at home receiving our household goods. We were right in the middle of a PCS. Oh. So the day I took <laughs> off on this trip, the truck pulled up to deliver our belongings. So my husband had to decide where it went, where to put that rug or that picture. And I wasn't there to have control over any of it. So I realized during that trip, I remember when he sent me an email and he had detailed out all these things that were going on while I was gone. And it really shifted my perspective because I want to say a couple things. One, I actually appreciated the details yeah. because I was missing them and it made me feel like I was actually there. And I realized back when I was doing that at home and he was gone, that I was actually robbing him of experiencing things at home that he would have liked to have been part of. But the other thing I realized was um, I I didn't have time when I was the one overseas, I didn't have time to necessarily respond back with the same amount of detail and the same amount of effort. And I remember sitting there go, I hope he'll forgive me for the, for the fact that I don't have the time to respond, but that I appreciate it. And right. I may have time later. And I think what that helped me realize was 
when I have that opportunity it again to actually detail out those, those important details, I need to set my expectations and remember that just because he doesn't have the time or the ability to detail out a huge response, that doesn't mean he doesn't appreciate it. And he doesn't mean he doesn't want me to do it again. Yeah. So it really shifted my perspective a little bit, but everybody that I talked to overseas actually really appreciated those details. It, they just wanted families to realize they may not be able to respond the, the way that you're respond, you're emailing them, but it's so, so important. So keep those details going. And, you know, maybe we don't give them a novel, right? right, right. But we <laughs> give them the gist, give them the gist yeah. that it's important. <laughs> Well, and also to kind of um, change this a little bit, when you were overseas and, and doing, you know, checking out all of the locations, did you come across any USOs? I did. Oh my goodness. This is one of my favorite parts of the whole trip because it was so unexpected. And I feel so bad that it was unexpected, but I'll be honest, that entire trip, I just realized every day, many times a day, just how naive I actually was. But I don't, I don't feel bad or embarrassed about that because I think all of us as spouses, we don't know what we don't know. Right. right. And so when I went over to, especially to Afghanistan, um, which just happened to be a place that my husband had been deployed to, which was a very emotional experience for me to go there. Um, I was immediately greeted um, by a woman named Regina who works for the USO. She's actually over, she's at, actually at Fort Stewart now, yeah. but she greeted me and welcomed me. And I was like, who the heck are you? Like, who's this woman in civilian clothes in Afghanistan? And she told me she works with the USO and took me to the USO that's there in this remote location in Afghanistan. And it blew my mind. I, first of all, I had no idea that there was these little pop-up USOs, but I burst into tears and I'll tell you why because I was so emotional going to Afghanistan and visiting with all these troops, especially close to Christmas. Um, I felt so disconnected. I felt like, I remember feeling as a spouse, how I couldn't even hug my husband yeah. when he was deployed and how much I wish that I could have hugged him. I wish that I could serve him a cup of coffee, right? When right. he wanted it. And to meet Regina at the USO and everybody else that was working at the USO, they, I realized in that moment, they were an extension of me. Yeah. They were an extension of us as a family that I couldn't be the one to give them that cup of coffee or the telephone to call home when they needed it. But there was a warm person there to serve all of these um, service members, not just guys, but girls as well, to serve them, to give them just this one little piece of home to give them fun, to give them a break from everything that they have to go through. And I burst into tears, honestly, because I realized that if, if they weren't there, um, I couldn't deliver that to my husband, but there was somebody there that could. And yeah. I was amazed by hearing that there were people from the USO. Regina had lived out in Afghanistan for like five years of her life, not one year of deployment and coming home for a year and then going back. This woman had committed her life to five years continuously of living in Afghanistan simply because she loved our troops. And with that kind of love and compassion, it just moved me so much. And I have to say, she also was the one that directed me to the, to the telephones where I got to call my husband mm -hmm. from Afghanistan and wake him up first thing in the morning, like five in the morning, where he got that call from Maryland, right? right? Um, and have this full reversal moment, but it was all because of USO. And it completely changed my perspective of the USO for sure. It was a fantastic day. Oh, that warms my heart. And and we were stationed in Germany. Um, and we I was a brand new spouse and a very different experience, but similar to where I didn't even know where to turn or what to do as a brand new spouse. But as soon as I walked into a USO center for the first time in Germany, I felt, you know, at home or it just, there was this peace that came across. So um, maybe it was that cookie that they gave me and a cup of coffee and it just, I could sit down and relax finally and say, okay, this is, this is pretty cool. So. Well, you um, learn pretty quick that troops, you know, can tend to, depending on where they're at, have pretty crappy coffee and pretty crappy conditions sometimes, but to walk into the USO and have flavored coffee and it's constantly going and you've got a TV here and you've got everything. They've set up turkey trots where, you know, people would chase this poor guy who worked for the USO, he would dress like a turkey at Thanksgiving and they would chase him down the tarmac. Like it's the idea that you're bringing fun to what is otherwise a very serious environment. So I was so, so thankful for that for sure. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And thank you to Regina, if you're listening. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, so to counteract the amount of stress that uh, the military style can bring to a marriage, what are a couple ways that military couples can introduce fun back into their marriage? Yeah, this is a huge one for Matt and I because he's a chaplain. It can tend to be a pretty serious job. I'm a counselor. It can tend to be a pretty serious job. And so we, after being married 20 years, we really um, have learned to value the importance of fun a whole lot more often. So I'm really encouraging a lot of military families. It can tend to be a serious lifestyle and a serious job, especially if you have young children. Life can be so crazy serious that incorporating a lot more fun to counterbalance that seriousness is super important. So I'll just be honest, our house loves superheroes. We have like dove into like the nerd deep end on superheroes simply to add more fun to our life. So Halloween's coming up. We dress up like superheroes. Um, we have conversations about that too, but going on date nights that are a little bit more fun. Like I can't even tell you how much fun it is if you've not tried escape rooms with your spouse. So it's one of my favorite things to do right now. They can tend to be a little bit on the pricey side, but being able to go and actually work together in a fun environment where you have to lean on each other's strengths and you get to know what each other are actually good at. Yes, we all know that you're good at like managing the household and working your job and taking care of the kids, but for your spouse to actually see that you may actually have a strength and strategy or that you're able to find details quickly or to see that in your spouse is so, um, it just reignites something in your marriage. So you may do something else like go outside and start bike riding, go camping, um, rent an MWR camper, like do something yeah. that is different than the ordinary. Because what we have nowadays is families that come home, they have a stressful day, they sit on the couch, they Netflix for the rest of the evening. Mm -hmm. They're having shared experiences sitting in front of the TV, but they're not face to face experiences where they're actually connecting as a couple. So there's nothing wrong with binge watching that TV show. Um, but when are we more strategically putting our devices away and actually paying attention to each other and spicing things up with something a little bit different and a little bit more multi-sensory? Going back to that sacred spaces thing, if we're going to have these big multi-sensory things that separate us because we can't understand what somebody went through, you can counteract that by actually having more um, multi-sensory moments together that are fun. So is it something that involves some kind of physicality? Does it involve your sight? Not So sight is just watching TV and hearing is just watching TV. But okay. if there's physicality, touch, taste, all of that, you're going to have a really fantastic evening together. Well, and I'm, I just heard the other day that actually, if you use more of your senses like that, that you're more likely to remember that experience as well. So, yes, you know, I don't know if that's a fact or not, but it is, is it? it okay. is, <laughs> it is actually your, your brain actually, um, when you are experiencing a big moment and you have adrenaline that goes through your body. So a traumatic moment or a happy moment, joy filled moment, your, your senses, the sensory part of your brain lights up and it opens up all of your senses. That's why in a traumatic experience, that a lot of our service members have gone through, if something triggers them in a sensory way, it feels like they hear it again, see it again, smell it again, they're stuck in the past. So if those multi-sensory parts of our brain are collecting all of that information in that big moment, it's almost like scarring a memory in our mind. But we have, what we don't realize is we have the capacity to create memories that are actually good and powerful and happy um, yeah. if we incorporate all of our five senses. So you're right on target on that. Well, and it makes me think too, how you've, how you also, you can hear a song, but I don't know how that plays into this, but if yeah. you hear a song, it can take you back again to another memory or a time. Perfect example. Yeah. Perfect example. Well, I'm going to go back to the book because there was so much in the book that I was highlighting and taking notes. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, but in the book, you said that during marriage retreats, uh, you found that fear is the root issue of couples inability to be vulnerable with each other. And that across the board, men and women fear weakness, failure, and rejection. So can you give us more context to expand um, on this theory? Yeah, this is a huge topic. So I'm, I'm not going to dive too deep in this because okay. I want to make sure that there's other questions that we'll get to from other people that are participating. But I am going to say 
that fear is the number one thing that I find that um, separates us as couples, that causes problems within our marriage. Honestly, it causes problems within any of our relationships. You can have fear that interrupts your relationship even with your child. So fear, the root of it really comes down to the lies and beliefs that we have adopted over time in our life, starting from childhood on. And fear itself is kind of like a cancer. And if you leave the more you avoid dealing with fear in your life, the more room you leave for it to spread and right. expand and get bigger. And so for couples, I see all the time that there is a fear of being vulnerable. Um, there's actually some great, a great set of books. Actually, it's made into one book now um, that I usually recommend that you can dive a little bit deeper on the importance of vulnerability in your marriage. But one of my favorite authors is Shanti Feldhan. Okay. Um, I know that you guys are going to share that link. But um, she wrote for women only, for men only, um, and it really addresses how men understand love, but also how women understand love as well. Different from the whole Mars and Venus books from years right. ago, um, this one is really diving into helping us understand our spouse better, but it also helps you understand that if you're, if you're a woman and you're married to a man, being able to understand what his understanding of vulnerability is, and men just as much fear weakness. They fear failing. Um, and if we understood that we all have that fear, we actually, on the flip side, being married to our spouse, have such a great capacity to heal that. Mm -hmm. If we are careful and respectful of it and be more mindful of the words that we are directing towards our spouse. So your spouse just as much has a fear of failure as you do, but marriage itself is this amazing crucible. And if we understood how it's made and why it's so hard, the whole point of marriage is to sharpen us and to make us better. It's not necessarily about happiness all the time. We all thought that when we got married, but right. surprise, surprise, that happiness kind of goes up and down and up and down. And it's normal to have peaks and valleys in your marriage. The important thing though, is to be able to understand that your ability to be vulnerable and it kind of expose yourself as far as your weaknesses, your flaws, your insecurities, to work on those as well, that is what actually um, lends itself to a very strong, healthy marriage. So I just wanna remind everybody out there that marriage itself is hard, but it's meant to shape you into a better person. If you're taking care of yourself and investing in yourself, growing as a person, asking your spouse to do the same, marriage will either grow you into a better person or it's going to, over time, um, shove you out. Because nobody likes to be married to somebody who's not growing. Right. Nobody likes to be married to somebody who's not changing, right? As in the good way. Right. So as long as we keep focused on that, the vulnerability is a key piece of that. Fear is what's going to rob us from the ability to be vulnerable. By the way, if you guys um, know Brene Brown, she does a ton of stuff on vulnerability, um, which is very much connected to fear and shame. She's another really great person to read any of her books that will kind of help you understand not just your understanding of vulnerability, but also a man's version of vulnerability, which can look a little bit different. Oh, so interesting. Thank you for that. Yeah, we well, could go on forever on that I one. Know, no, it's so interesting though. That's why I'm glad you were able to explain that more in detail because in the book, I'm like, what does this mean? Tell me more. So um, very helpful. And I'm going to actually open it up to the Q&A box and see what we have in there. Um, so for any of the spouses that have any questions for Corey, go ahead and ask away. Um, otherwise, I have a couple other questions I will ask her if we don't have any in there. And you can go in as anonymous too if you don't wanna put your name associated with it. And by the way, I am totally comfortable with and answering or addressing any marriage topic, especially as it relates to military. So those of you who are attending, I'm so glad that you're here. And if you have a question, this is a really great time to ask a marriage counselor <laughs> questions because I know we have a lot of them. So don't be afraid. Well, one of the questions says, will this webinar be available to rewatch later? And yes, it will be. Uh, if you just type in Coffee Connection Live in the USO, uh, we'll have it up in a couple of days on, the, on, on our website. So let's see here. Um, oh, sorry about that. Oh, no, no worries. As long as you don't break that mug. <laughs> no, no, no. no I'm, that's in a safe place. Okay. And Ashley has a question, has your husband ever spoken publicly on his experience while you were deployed? If so, what was that like for him? Um, 
so I'm assuming she's asking about the role reversal. Possibly. If I can get some clarification, I'll kind of answer it that way. Okay. Um, but I think what she's asking is, yes. has my husband ever spoken publicly about his perspective of when I was gone? So yes. Um, so a couple of places you can find out more about that. Number one, I threaded that throughout the book. So you'll be able to hear not only, um, you'll see emails that he was writing me at the time, what he was discovering from his perspective. Um, I also kind of share back and, and I'm really vulnerable in the book to share even emails from his deployments of the things that he was sharing with me. And so it's kind of a complicated story, but there's plenty that you'll hear from his perspective throughout the book. Um, there's also, um, for those of you who are interested in doing it as a study or as a small group, um, on my site, life-giver.org, um, there is actually, there in the section with the book, there's actually videos where I actually did every single day of that trip, I did a raw video blog, if you will, where I shared from that country what I experienced during that day. And what I also did is at the very end of it, right when I came back from that trip, Matt and I sat down together and did kind of a reintegration video together where we talked about like fresh into that, like when I got home, yeah. some of the things that he learned, some of the things that I was learning from that kind of reintegration moment and kind of recap a lot of that. So that's where you can find some more about that. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, with my husband being deployed, I feel like I don't always want to be honest with him about how I'm feeling with him gone because I don't want him to be upset or feel bad that he isn't here to help. Any suggestions on how to communicate my struggles and how much I miss him in a positive way? Yeah, this is a great question. In fact, when I was actually in Afghanistan, I had a conversation with um, a, a troop, a service member that was over there in Afghanistan about this in particular. And so one of the things that we talked about was the fact that um, it's so important for you to be honest and share how you feel. Every, um, all of our spouses want to know that we miss them. And I think we need to be able to share those things. We need to share that when, when we're overwhelmed, we need to be able to share um, if we're having a tough time. It's, I don't think it's healthy or good for a marriage for you to hold that back and never share that you're having a hard time or that you miss them. They want to be missed, right? Just as much as you want to be missed. So definitely share that. But one of the things that he and I, this service member and I agreed on was that we want to be careful to not bleed on our spouse, right? So if we are just constantly venting and it's constant negativity, that's when it becomes unhelpful and unproductive because from his perspective, he was saying actually how if it kept staying negative and there was never either positivity mentioned or gratitude, especially if you as a spouse are not reaching out to your local support, there's things that that service member can't do to make it better. And so there, there's a point where it goes from communication to powerlessness on their part. And that's where they start to really get anxious and start to feel like, I don't know what to do when my marriage is in trouble because I'm not there, right? So that's when we cross that line and it does impact their ability to not only stay focused on the mission, but also powerlessness in your marriage. So definitely be honest. But if you find yourself kind of sharing, I'm really having a difficult time today. I just want to let you know it was a bad day, but I reached out to a friend for support or I'm going out for coffee tomorrow. So I'm sure I'm going to feel better tomorrow. I really miss you, but I'm so thankful that you're doing what you love to do because I will tell you, Every service member that I came across overseas, which also changed my perspective in a huge way, loved what they were doing. Yeah. Even though it was Christmas, I expected to see a bunch of sad troops. I'll be honest. I expected to see a tear rolling down their cheek. Like I'm missing my family at Christmas oh. and they were missing everybody at Christmas. We had those conversations too, but I will tell you, they were genuinely fulfilled and that they were doing what they were trained to do, what they had been waiting to do. We have to remember that when they're home with us, it's like they're in school. They're just training, training, training. They're never getting to do actually the job. For them to go overseas is their opportunity to actually do all this training. And I actually had the same service member told me that it's like being in school all the time, but when you deploy, suddenly you actually get to do the job. Yeah. So I think it, it's important for us to remember that they are genuinely loving what they get to do. And as long as we are communicating in a way that says, I miss you, I hate that we're apart, but I'm so glad that you get to do what you love. And 
I'm having a rough time, but I'm going to reach out for help where I need it. I think it's great, honest conversation for you as a couple. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. And there's a lot of questions coming in now. So here we go. Okay. I'll go quicker. Yeah, no, no, no. You're fine. This is, this is great. We've got, we've got time. So um, another question was they're interested in your take on um, a parent staying in a city with teens to finish high school while the spouse Mm. moves for jobs, a potential of six years apart. How do we make the marriage stay strong and still have them be present in our lives? I like the idea of full detail in our daily lives, but sometimes I am bad at that or just tired. Any thoughts or suggestions? Okay, so this is a hot topic. Um, Geobatching is what she's talking about. It's, it is a huge trend right now for a lot of families. So I'm gonna give a two-sided answer on this. Um, I will say, and, and the spouse that's asking this question, bear with me as I answer the first part of this, okay? So the first part of this, I have to say as a clinician that if you can avoid geobatching, I am asking you to not do it. Um, Our family has considered doing it several times, so it's an understandable thing for you to contemplate, think about, and talk about as a couple. My family has moved every year and a half, and it's been extremely disruptive to not only my career, but my children's education as well. So I totally get it. I have a child that has some special medical issues, so I totally get that as well. Um, I will say from a clinical perspective that if we can stay together as much as possible, that's what's gonna be healthiest for the marriage. However, I do know that there are times when there are families that are geobatching. I do support geobatching if it comes down to a medical crisis that makes you need to stay present for the medical care that your family member is receiving. If there's a financial crisis, if there is a professional crisis, if there is a a huge issue that says this is a temporary thing that we need to do for our family, but it will eventually change, then that's understandable. So if you find yourself in a situation where you are geobatching for a long time, um, this is why you have to be super intentional. So more than just those detailed emails, which I would highly recommend. And if we're doing those, if we're going on six years, then we need to have check-ins on a regular basis in our marriage and also in a business kind of check-in with our, your family as well. So being able to talk with your spouse about, is this, is our communication effective? Do you want me to pull back? Is it too much information? Do you need more? Um, How is our marriage doing? What could we do to make it better? This is a really tough situation. I would also recommend that your finances are going to look much different geobatching. And so I would highly recommend you budget accordingly so that you can fly and go visit each other, that you're making that part of your budget so that you can find times to do fun things together and have that family time together to keep your relationship strong. So that's a big topic. Um, I actually, on my YouTube channel, interviewed um, Susie Schwartz. She's an Air Force. uh, She was an Air Force chief of staff spouse, senior spouse. And we actually talked about geobatching when she actually um, thought about it as well. So I know that for sure that I addressed it in that interview. That's a great question. Great question. It's such a hard topic to talk about. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So how do we deal with spouses bring, bringing up suicidal thoughts? I, I felt com- or completely hopeless and lost with the therapy we've gone through. Big question. Huge question, right? Um, and this is a question that comes up more often than not. And so um, there are lots of reasons why somebody might have suicidal thoughts. So first of all, I want to tell you as a spouse, you are not a clinician, right? And you don't have to be one. And so I really want to make sure I put you guys in, um, in the right mindset that some of you might even be caregivers to veterans who might be struggling with suicidal thoughts as well. And there are limits to your abilities and there's also limits to your energy. So anytime you feel like something is going on but in your marriage or with your spouse or even your children, that is something that feels like it's out of your lane. It's okay for you to set those healthy boundaries and go, this is out of my lane. You need professional help. And suicidal thoughts is definitely one of those that we were probably trying, going to ask for support more, you know, sooner than not. So if your spouse is having those thoughts, it can be exhausting, especially if they're bringing it up on a continuous basis. So um, I often find that if they are having those kind of thoughts, it's because they're feeling hopeless or powerless in their situation. And so connecting them with friends, um, it's really hard to answer this question because I don't know if it's a, um, 
mental disorder kind of thing, if it's a PTSD kind of thing, if it's um, a spouse who's feeling loneliness, right? So, but I can tell you for overall health, you can encourage and set healthy boundaries with your spouse. And maybe we put up the link for the boundaries book by Townsend and Cloud, because I know that sounds crazy that if somebody in your life is having suicidal thoughts that you would set boundaries with that person, because you would think that we'd rush in and help. And there are times that we definitely always, not times, we always need to have love and kindness behind our words. Um, but boundaries are a way of learning how to surround your, surround that person and go, I love you, but I can't be the one to save you from this. You have to get help. That's setting boundaries. It may be you calling that person for help. It may be if it's a person who constantly threatens suicidal thoughts, but it's not something that they're actually serious about, but they're doing it kind of as a way to cry out for help or for attention. That's another thing for boundaries to be able to go, this is... This is getting to the point where I never know if you're serious or you're not. Either way, this is something that needs to change in your life and my life and in our life. And it's time for us or you or both to get help. That's a boundary, right? Yeah. So um, that's a big question. And I am more than welcome if that spouse wants to reach out to me. Definitely reach out to me and I can address that question a little bit better. Okay, great. So can you talk about how to have meaningful discussions with your husband during deployment? Many of our conversations are brief and an opportunity for him to see our baby over video call. Yeah. So being a lot more intentional, the question is how do I make it more connective, intimate? Um, I would say a couple things. Number one, we need to set our expectations of, is this the best time to have as intimate of a conversation? Cause it may not be a good time for them. Right. So it's setting those expectations. Yeah. So asking questions at the beginning of that call or beforehand is super important. How much time do you have? What would you like to do during this call? Right. Because your spouse may come back and say, actually, can I have a call with just you and not the baby? right? That is a, something we need to communicate. And we need to have both of those. Yes, every opportunity is a, is a time for the kids to be in front of the camera. But I don't know if they were like my kids, but when my kids were in front of the camera, they were more focused on their own picture than dad, right? <laughs> right? So it was kind of counterproductive. So maybe we schedule both, like have time for the family calls, but actually have and schedule date night or date hours or whatever where you proactively ahead of time say, this is what we're gonna talk about. Here's three questions um, that you can talk about. Um, this is also a really great place. I'm throwing resources at you guys, um, but there's a great book called How to Love Me that I think is a fantastic tool for when you're deployed. Um, you can, it's a, it's a book that you can fill out. There's tons of like blanks and fill in the blanks for you to fill out. And you keep one and your spouse keeps one and you fill it out and then you can send them to each other. And then you could talk about that during your calls. There's also um, one of my good friends, Dr. Les Parrott um, made the Better Love Assessment. Um, that's an assessment that you guys can take and then go over that assessment together on your calls. It really does a good healthy checkup on your marriage in a very positive way. And it'll give you tons of things to talk about as well. Thank you for all the resources. This is this mm -hmm. is super helpful. And um, Danielle's in there. I know she's finding everything and putting it in the chat. So thank you, Danielle, for that. Excellent. Okay. So we have, um, what about when there is a lack of communication? Oh, let's see here. It wrote, I'm just going to read it. Piggybacking on that. What about when there is a lack of communication possible? As a submariner, my husband has very little access to communicate during deployments. Is there a good way to be able to get that honesty out in some other way that doesn't seem like you're always complaining or dumping on friends? Hopefully that question is clear enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough question. I think I'm understanding um, if you don't have much connectivity with your spouse and there's a lot, not just um, for Navy, but there's a lot of special ops families out there that have no communication whatsoever, whatsoever and don't even know where their spouse is. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different kinds of situations where we find ourselves um, not being able to connect with our spouse for long periods of time. Um, there's a couple things I think you can do. Like she mentioned, definitely taking some things to your friends, but we also do need to be careful to not bleed on our friends as well. There needs to be good, healthy boundaries for ourselves and what we bring to our relationships because even our friendships can't handle all of our stuff, right? We need to maybe spread it out just a little bit. Um, but I would, I know this sounds like a very counselor thing to say, but picking up a deployment journal, 
like go and pick out a really great book that you love and to write in and journal out those thoughts and feelings before you take them to a friend and before you take them to your spouse. You'd be surprised at how much you can get out and how much you can figure out if you write about it. And then you're actually taking your conclusions to your spouse and you're not taking that time to go through figuring it out. Everybody processes information in different ways, but if you can write it out, then when you do have a chance to get together, instead of venting it all because you haven't seen each other or heard each other from, for a very long time, you can actually just do a recap on this is actually what I've learned about myself since we've last talked. And if you set that up with your spouse as well, that they're going to be actively working on a book with you, um, maybe they're journaling too, but you pick out like maybe Shanti Feldhan's book to read together, yeah. that you have those productive conversations, you'll catch up with each other and you'll be more in sync with each other when you have a chance to get together instead of just kind of word vomiting on each other and then it was completely unproductive. Love it. Love it. No. And, and there's, I mean, yeah, you just have to get creative. And um, what we did when, when my husband was deployed and although we did have some, you know, ways to communicate to each other, but, and I, I feel like you've mentioned this before, but um, just having a daily question and going through email. Mm -hmm. And it was like, if, you could live in four different locations and the four different seasons, where would you live or something like that. And so yeah. each day we had a, you know, and if we couldn't get to it every day, that's fine, but we still had something to communicate back and forth to each other. And it was fun to learn more about them um, that I, you know, stuff that I didn't even know. So um, yeah. And that um, how to love me book will give you like a million of those questions. Perfect. So that's a great resource. If you don't know what to ask each other. Yep. Good. Okay. Um, so next question, and I'm just going to read it. So my hubs and I spent almost two years apart with him being a geo bachelor. Now we are back together, but he's on recruiting duty. So he's here, but not really. My question is how do we integrate as a couple or reintegrate as a couple or a team? I feel like we are bumping heads a lot and we have very different ways of parenting and running the household. Okay, first of all, recruiting is, is such one of those really tough jobs where they are gone a lot. And so I totally understand and, and um, respect the situation that you're in um, to the spouse that asked that question. Um, you know, here's um, one of my, the things that I do with a lot of couples. I love doing a strength solution-based approach with a lot of the couples because it's fast, it's quick, it resolves so many issues of conflict and parenting differences and how you navigate around the household in different ways. And so, and from a positive perspective. And so I love, love, love the Gallup Strength Finder assessment. Um, there's lots of assessments out there that you could do. And I'm sorry, I did not give you the link for that. And if you're not able to pull it up, I'll give it to you later or I'll chime in later and put that link in there. You can get it from um, gallupstrengthcenter.com. Um, but basically you take this assessment and it shows you what you're good at and it shows you how you see the world and how you're motivated. And I think that what that does for you guys as a couple is it gets you a very, very quick tool to be able to see your spouse and go, oh man, he's challenging me on how I vacuumed the carpet because he has an entirely different approach to vacuuming the carpet. Mm -hmm. It's not that he is critiquing you or butting heads with you as much as he might be strategic, right? And you are just doing it because you love everybody and want the house to be clean, right? That's two right. different approaches to the same task. And I know I'm using that as a funny example, but we really do find ourselves butting heads in marriage when they come home and they load the dishwasher differently than we want them to, right? Or they're parenting maybe from a little colder perspective than the warmth that we bring the nurturing approach as a mom, let's say. So the strengths I think I have found is a very quick solution focused way for you to actually see the good in your spouse again, to see that they're actually bringing the best version of themselves to the table. And so are you, right. the spouse that asked that question, isn't that what you're wanting? You're wanting your spouse to see that you're number one, doing the best you can. Number two, you're bringing your best version to the table and it may not be his way, right? But it's your way. And so I think we need to find the ability to love our spouse again for the thing that attracted us in the first place that's now driving us crazy. And one of the ways that we can do that is a strengths perspective. So um, to that spouse or anybody else that's interested, please reach out to me. I can tell you more about the strengths and the coaching that goes with that. Um, but it's a very quick way for you to get back on the same page with your spouse again. Um, and I find that a lot of military families, that's what they want. They don't want to do tons of talk therapy right. if it's not a trauma situation. They're actually just wanting to get on the same page together quickly and figure out what that root issue is. Yeah. Okay. Great. 
How do you work with wanting to get back into the work field and the struggle of having to work with your spouse's work schedule? Because let's be honest, the military is always up in the air and can change within seconds. I have two kids as well. So I'm struggling on the thought of is really getting back to work worth it? Yeah. So actually that piggybacks really well off of the strength finder, honestly, because I think um, I actually did some research where I pulled anonymously almost 800 military and first responder spouses anonymously and asked them, um, how are they really doing? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and anonymously, what I got back was a majority of them are not doing great. And mm -hmm. when I really got into the details of that, it, what really came out was um, a lot of spouses are not sure what brings them purpose, what brings them joy. Um, and when I actually asked them that question, what does bring you joy? Most spouses answered the fact that they were a wife and a mother. And it really came down to their roles. And that's why they're not doing so well. It doesn't mean you can't experience joy and happiness being a wife and mother. But if that is the only thing that you're doing, and if that's the only role that you have, you're going to find yourself burned out and exhausted. Yeah. And so being able to know what brings you joy. I know the USO does some great stuff with Brittany Bacher on finding your spark. She has a great workbook um, that helps you find your identity and purpose in that spark again. But going back to the question, as far as working again, first of all, I think it's about knowing what it is that brings you joy and what you're good at. Um, and then being able to communicate that with your spouse to say, this is something I love being a wife or husband, depending on if you're a male, or female asking this question, but I love being your spouse. I love being a parent, but there's also this piece of me that loves this. And I find fulfillment in doing that. So part of it in marriage is communicating the importance and the value behind what it is that you're needing in your life. And then it's working together to figure out how are you going to make that happen? There are lots of ways that you can um, successfully work. And yes, it asks a lot more flexibility of you as a spouse. That's why a lot of spouses work remotely from home. That's what I do. Um, and being very creative to make your career creative. And there's lots of ways that if you need help with that, reach out to the USO, reach out to me. I'll connect you to the right places too to help you find a job that is creative and flexible. But I do want to answer that question and that it all comes down to communication in your marriage and communicating the value of this and what you need in order to succeed at that. And knowing that we can't go to our spouse and go, it's my turn. That never works in a marriage. I, I've seen it so many times. Spouses get to a place of resentment where they go to an extreme and they're so tired of it. That's why they geobatch. Or they go to their marriage and say, it's my turn and I want you to revolve around me for a change. It's not going to work. The only thing that does to your spouse is it makes that puts them in an ultimatum to choose their marriage or their job. And that's not a good place to be in because no matter what they choose, they lose. Yeah. So instead, if we go to our marriage and say, this, this is what I need in my life. How can we work this out? kind of negotiate it. And so that you have something that's fulfilling you, he has something that's fulfilling him and it's a marriage decision, not a you decision. Yeah. Well, and you brought up the, the loss of identity and we've mentioned this before on calls um, in the past, but we did, the USO did a research um, study last year. And uh, one of the top key insights that we found was that spouses feel as though they've lost their, their um, mm -hmm. sense of identity and purpose. So again, you mentioned the Brittany Bacher workshops, and that's one of the reasons why we have her out, you know, doing these workshops called Discovering Your Spark Across the Board, just because we want to help the spouses with that. And because we know it is so important. And we were talking to a spouse yesterday, actually, and she's like, you know, I've, I've never heard that out loud before, but she's mm -hmm. like, but I get it. And I, yes, she's like, that's so true that, you know, you, as a military spouse, you do kind of lose your sense of identity in a way. So how do you find that again? So, well, Nicole, I actually had a conversation yesterday too with a local yeah. spouse who was like, I don't know who I am anymore. Yeah. And so I do want to speak to those spouses who have young children at home. You know, my children are now 12 and 15. Um, and I can tell you that the season, if you're in that season of young kids, um, it will eventually change. I promise you it will change. And I would, I want to just encourage you that you are not um, missing out. You're not ruining your career. You're not ruining your opportunity for a career later by focusing on those small, tiny humans. Um, in fact, even volunteering just 
five hours a month doing something that you feel good at, you can put that on your resume. I told a spouse yesterday, do you realize that your resume never asks you to put down what you made for doing that job? Nowhere right. in your resume does it say that you had to put that you were being paid. So you can keep building your resume, doing something that you love to do outside of those roles. Um, it doesn't have to be much, but I really want to encourage those of you that have tiny children that you are not um, messing up your career. I was worried about that when I was at home with my kids when they were small, but I can tell you, I had no idea that my career would be where it is right now. And if I took like five years off and can be doing what I'm doing right now, then you're going to be fine. Honestly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. For that. Yeah. So we have three more questions and, and then I'm going to cut it off there. But um, this is something where Corey and I knew that this was going to be a hot topic and we can always create another conversation for another time too. But um, I'm going to get to these three questions. We'll try. As a 12 year mill spouse, I am feeling more and more that I want it to be my turn. I want to follow my dreams and my spouse often feels guilty for thinking he is keeping it from or keeping me from it. How do we juggle this? I try so hard not to make him feel this way because I do appreciate his contribution to the service and our marriage, but I need to feel fulfilled as well. So I think piggybacking off what I said a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. I think what I would add to that is um, there are some feelings of resentment and frustration that we are naturally going to have as a military spouse that we need to take to the right people. Um, I have found even in my own marriage that when I have days where I feel like that, because believe me, I think it happened the other day. Um, so I totally know how it feels to like have something in your mind. And then all of a sudden the military asks you to just take that thing and wrap it all around <laughs> what the military wants. So we're going to have an emotional reaction to that. Um, most of the time, I think I've learned over this amount of time being a military spouse for about the same amount of time as, as our, um, spouse that was just asking that is that it doesn't often work for me to take it to my husband to answer that question and to take that resentment to him because this is one of those sacred spaces, right? He doesn't know what it's like to be a military spouse with a creative career, constantly bending to the military's needs. He knows what it's like to be a service member, constantly bending to the military's needs. And we're going to constantly find ourselves in conflict because it's going to be going back to that competition thing of who has it worse, right? So what I have found is there are some mentors in my life. There are some, some female for me, some female military spouses that have been in longer than me. That's where I take that resentment and that frustration or my bad day. And I can guarantee you if, you, if you find a mentor that you can go to, that you know is going to be honest with you, that you know is going to challenge you if you actually need it, then that's what we need. We don't need to take it to somebody who's going to agree with it and then add fuel to the fire because we're not going to be a better person for it. So take it to a mentor who can cast vision, give you perspective. There's going to be times that she's going to go, you're right. That is just so frustrating. And I don't blame you. I feel the same way. Right. Yeah. Might direct you in a good way. Um, but she may also go, yeah, but you're not seeing this. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll just say very quickly, my mentor said to me, um, yeah, but Corey, you're forgetting the fact that it's such a blessing that your spouse still has a job, right? Because there's a lot of service members that are getting those pink slips or that get looked over and not promoted. And then they have to struggle to figure out how to transition. And if your spouse still has a job, that's what it took for me to kind of change my perspective is my spouse is doing such a great job. We have some stability for right now. And that's what I need to focus on. Well, and that's a hot topic too with the, with the mentor piece, because sometimes a lot of, well, we have spouses coming to us saying, how do I even find a mentor? So um, it's, I'm going to plug in our spouse mm -hmm. squad. We just piloted this program called spouse squad, where we want to have spouse and military spouses have a mentor or a life coach to help them get through these types of um, military transitions throughout their life and, and to have somebody to talk to about that. Um, their daily life. So, and somebody that can help them relate. So spouse squad, we'll put up the link to that as well. Thank you, Danielle, for doing that. Um, and you can check that out again. It's a pilot and we want to get feedback from anybody that's, um, who checks it out. So, so I'm going to go quick on those last two questions because yes. I want to make sure I get those in for you. Okay, perfect. How do you handle dealing with you yourself having PTSD and feeling like you can't talk to your husband about it because he has said, he has said he can't handle being told anything negative. 
Yeah. So big, huge topic, right? So this goes back to you asking for help and taking that to a professional if you need it. But you, there are so many military spouses that actually have PTSD themselves, and it tends to have a lot of attention on the veteran actually that gets PTSD. So if you have PTSD, I think it goes back to where are you taking those symptoms and that conversation. There's, there's a lot of places like a clinician, some friends, I'd be careful to not, because we might get into bleeding, PTSD and those symptoms um, are going to really rush out of us. We're going to have that emotional flooding, especially if we're getting triggered a lot. So your friends may not be able to handle some of that. So going to a counselor, doing the really good work in a counselor's office, then you're bringing positive messages to your spouse and saying, this is what I'm learning about my mm -hmm. symptoms and how I'm working to push through it and the suggestions of how you can help me. That's a much different kind of conversation. Okay. Thank you. All right. Last question. Can you speak to what to look for in a therapist? For the first time in our marriage of 15 years, we are in need of counseling, honestly, to avoid divorce. I feel like I'm more one foot out the door, but still love him. And we all know divorce is definitely not the easier choice for many reasons. Thank you for any insight on what to look for in a therapist and any other ways we can avoid splitting. There's a lot of resentment and pain that's been unresolved over the course of about nine years. Okay, so first of all, I'm so proud of the spouse for not only asking this question, but also for continuing to fight for your marriage. Um, I, I am a firm believer that there are only a few cases of where a marriage needs to fall apart, okay? So if you are willing to fight for your marriage, I am strongly suggesting to fight for it and fight for it correctly. And going to a counselor is going to help you do that. And I love this question. I get this question all the time. So quickly, I think the answer to that is... Um, how there's lots of different ways you can find counseling, but most of you probably have benefits like TRICARE. And so um, TRICARE is a great place to start to find that counselor. Um, I know I dug for a long time into Psychology Today, which is a great tool, psychologytoday.com, um, does help you look for clinicians and you can filter things like a marriage counselor or if you're dealing with infidelity or the, who takes TRICARE. But I found myself digging into so many profiles and it was stressful for me too to try to find referrals that I created the Life Giver directory. So if you go to life-giver.org, there is a clinician directory of over a hundred clinicians who have said, we want to work with military families and they are either qualified. And most of them, by the way, are either military spouses or veterans themselves, first responder spouses who know the culture. And that's what I hear from most people. I want to go to somebody that understands me and understands our lifestyle. So that's why I created the directory so that you could find somebody easily. So that's a big way to find somebody. But um, I would definitely, in, this, in the search fields, you can look for things like that's specific to your topics. Don't be afraid to call a clinician and say, here is the topic that I'm wrestling with. How would you handle working with us? Um, but listen, counseling is kind of like dating, okay? So if you go to a counselor and you feel like it's not really a good fit, then I'm going to encourage you to talk to that counselor and ask them to go a different direction. We are trained to be able to provide whatever you need. So if you, if somebody comes to me and goes, I'm not sure if I'm liking the direction we're going, I'm either going to explain why we're going in that direction, or I'm going to alter it based off of what you're asking from me. And if you go to a few sessions and it's not a good fit, don't be afraid to find another one. Yeah. Everybody has a different style and personality. So if you have more questions about that, please reach out to me. I'll be more than happy to kind of guide you in a little bit direction um, and maybe even help search on the directory to find somebody that works for you. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, we are at time. So I do want everybody to know how to reach you um, through your website. And I wanted to give you a shout out on your podcast um, because you have that amazing resource as well. So let us know everything we need to know um, in the last couple seconds we have. Yeah, quickly. Um, yeah, so thank you for putting up those links. I already mentioned the Life-Giver is, is the site where most of my content is there. You can find more um, about me at thecoreyweathers.com. The Life-Giver podcast is available on most platforms, and I take kind of the clinical approach to address marriage topics in the service marriage. So it's called the Life-Giver podcast. We are currently in season four, um, so that's been super fun. But you can also reach me at my email is info at coreyweathers.com. Um, so they're doing a great job spelling it, which is great. Um, but otherwise, um, that, I mean, pretty much <laughs> there's a YouTube channel. You'll find everything that you need to on both of those websites and they're right. linked. So you'll find both of them. 
Excellent. Well, thank you so much for today, Corey. This has been so helpful for so many spouses out there, including myself. Um, and for the spouses out there, our next Coffee Connection Live will be next month. We're still determining the date. Um, so just check out Coffee Connection Live um, online and we'll put up the information once we have it on the next speaker and date. And also there's a survey that will be sent to you after uh, the call, if you can please fill that out. And if you have any additional questions um, that you really like us to, to answer, then please put that in the survey and we'll, we'll get those out as well. But thank you, Corey, so much for your time today. It's been wonderful. And thank you to all the spouses out there and for everything that you all do on a daily basis. We appreciate you and hope you all have a fabulous day. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye.